Hi, my name is Micah Long and I'm a critical care anesthesiologist. As our hospital has slowly increased how many patients we put on VA ECMO, I realized that I needed a good core way to standardize the way we teach it and talk about ECMO that highlights not only what's happening to our patients, but the common problems that occur for our patients on ECMO. And to do that, I made this talk. This is an introduction to VA ECMO. Now I've given prior talks on this, but I'll remind you that ECMO is overwhelming to look at, but a very simple device. It is simply a pump, which is a centrifugal pump that runs at a set RPM, and it's a preload and afterload sensitive pump. Please take a glance at my prior ECMO equipment lecture if you want to go through some details about the pump. In addition to the pump, ECMO is an oxygenator that clears CO2 and adds oxygen. Everything else might look overwhelming, but is really quite superfluous to what we'll talk about today. The pump, of course, is, again, preload and afterload sensitive. So if you have a change in your blood flow for a given RPM, you need to look through the preload and afterload side and determine what's going on that caused that change. VA arterial ECMO normally is used when the heart is not working, but I still use that same drawing I've lectured on before. I draw a heart, the venous side of blood going through the RV into the lungs, and then the blood going out the lungs to the body with a red line showing the blood exiting. From here, I show or draw where the ECMO pulls blood from, in this case, the femoral our uh, vein, and where ECMO delivers blood to, in VA ECMO, typically the femoral artery. And reminder that ECMO just is a pump and an oxygenator, and so we'll pull some blue blood, run it through the oxygenator and pump, and pump it into the aorta. Now, what we have happen here is unique. We get blood moving backwards, up from the leg to the abdomen, chest, brain, and finally to the heart itself through the coronary arteries backwards. This is called retrograde aortic flow and it's crucial to understand for our patients on VA ECMO. It has some clinical implications. This is of course afterload producing and if you're on VA ECMO your heart's not working very well. So if you add on this big afterload amount things may change to your heart. Sometimes that increased afterload will be so strong, in fact, or the patient has aortic insufficiency, and that afterload will be delivered exactly to the LV, and that LV will progressively dilate, distort, and fail even worse. But it will also back up and deliver blood backwards into the lungs. So patients that are on VA ECMO are prone to having this problem of backflow and back pressure into the LV. That will result in progressive pulmonary edema. It happens frequently because we stop inotropy or discontinue balloon pumps in patients when they go on ECMO thinking that we've fixed the problems. This problem is very real, very severe, and warrants immediate therapy. You, of course, want to provide a temporizing solution or passive approach. You can do that by simply pulling more blood through to the ECMO device, offloading the venous side going to the LV. You can also improve ejection from your heart so that you fight the ECMO device by improving ejection with inotropy or by use of a balloon pump. You could sometimes turn down flow on your ECMO, but this occurs normally because the LV is failing horrifically, and that will result in low delivery of blood to the body. In truth, when this happens, you need to manage it definitively by LV decompression. You can do this in a host of ways. You can add in an ECMO drainage cannula. There are some that float from the pulmonary veins. There are some that go across the atria, and you could even, in a simple way, cut the atria uh, off so that instead of going to the lungs, you simply recirculate to the right side of the heart. 
You could alternatively put an LVAD in so that the LVAD helps the LV fight the flow from the ECMO. And you can, of course, use unique ECMO cannulation strategies, like the one I've shown in the bottom right, where we do VA ECMO via LA drainage, and then uh, um, get the blood out into the aorta with that approach. Now from here, we can make some good clinical judgments. The first patient I took care of on VA ECMO was as a critical care fellow, in fact. And the patient was a young person who had a STEMI, got CPR, and the cardiologist saved their life by stenting them. They had great LV function after, but had some persistent pulmonary edema and lung injury from chest compressions. They were hypoxic. I was called to the cath lab to help manage their vent, make sure their tube was in the right position and things like that. Their sat was low. I suggested to the team that I wouldn't be able to fix this sat on the short term and that you should consider VV ECMO if you think the sat is causing problems for the heart. The proceduralist didn't listen, however, and put the patient on VA ECMO. And that VA ECMO caused some real problems. Let's think through what happened. So I had a patient that had a normal heart function, but sick lungs. Here's my typical VA ECMO setup. Pull blood from the femoral vein, it's blue blood, give red blood up the aorta and back. Now what happens if this blood is pushed from the heart way down the aorta because the heart is so strong? What if that mixing point is really, really low? Well, not a problem if your lungs are working. In the case of blue blood coming out of the lungs because the lungs are failing, however, as the heart pumps, this blue mixing point is going to move down and down and down the aorta. And that mixing point can cause some real problems because the first vessels that come off here are the coronary arteries, which will get this blue mixed blood, and the head arteries, which are going to get this blue blood. This is called differential oxygenation or north-south syndrome. There's other colloquial terms for it, but the short story here is this is why we measure the right radial artery sat on a patient on VA ECMO. If you have heart recovery and the lungs aren't working, you may have hypoxia at these heart arteries and the brain arteries while your left hand sat or the overall patient appearance looks okay. The treatment for this overlap some of the treatment for flow mismatch on VV ECMO. Of course, there's the basic things. You want to fix the lungs so that they work. You can also make sure that the blood going through the lungs has more oxygen in it. In other words, you can escalate or raise your SVO2. You do that by optimizing DO2 and by optimizing VO2. Minimize, minimizing how much oxygen the patient's using by sedation, targeted temperature or fever avoidance, management of shivering, treating sepsis, and ensuring their cardiac output's okay. And then finally, you want to fix the flows. Sometimes we decrease the inotropy. I've never done that. Sometimes you increase the ECMO, where you're letting less preload be delivered to that LV. I've done that sometimes. But more often, when you have a true north-south syndrome, it's because your heart has recovered. And if your heart's recovered, maybe you don't need VA ECMO, or maybe minimally you need less VA ECMO. One approach to that is to simply change to VV ECMO. Another approach to that is to move to a cannulation strategy called VAV ECMO. VAV ECMO is interesting. It's where you use that venous blood you've pulled from the femoral vein, but then you send it through the ECMO out to the patient in two places. First, you send it in a typical VA setup. You send it up the femoral artery back towards the heart, making sure the arterial side has some DO2. Now, what you do is you put a little flow constrictor there and a flow meter there, so you can really mathematically figure out I want more or less flow through that area. 
by tightening or loosening that supply. You deliver the rest of the blood through a second cannula that goes to the venous side, kind of like a VV ECMO setup. Now you have red blood going through the lungs and improving that shunt mixture. This is very complex and of course relies on more cannulation, and so it's not always done, and you should cautiously approach it. It may be more straightforward to simply transition the patient off VA ECMO using inotropy and moving towards VV ECMO, knowing the heart may be guarded. But it highlights that this basic drawing can be used for a host of cannula considerations and options. This table details all the different sites and considerations for each in this wonderful publication uh, that I've cited below. Central cannulation I've shown with little Pac-Man drawings here and solving a lot of this north-south syndrome because you're cannulated so proximally. Other cannulation strategies are shown here, but if you know the basic drawing of a heart, venous side, arterial side, you can come up with answers to all of these things. The final point for today is how to wean VA ECMO. This is a common question. There's whole seminars on this, and I'm certainly not a publisher in this area in the literature, and so I would consider myself a beginner with this. ELSO does say if you run ECMO how they recommend, weaning is semi-automatic. In short, though, as your extracorporeal support decreases, you want to trial off. If your extracorporeal support is high, you don't want to trial off. How does that translate at the bedside? I found that a little challenging. What I look for at the bedside as a simple ECMO physician is increased pulsatility. If I'm pulling blood out of the femoral vein, the heart should be offloaded and it shouldn't be starling curved strong. It should be weak. If I'm getting good pulsatility, it's recovered some. If it's recovered some, I turn down the inotropy, and if it's still greatly pulsatile, things are looking good. Note that this is a little different because the RV is decompressed by ECMO, and as you turn down the ECMO, you'll not only need that pulsatility, you'll need to be sure that the right heart, and of course the left heart, but the right heart particularly, is going to need to deal with the higher amount of blood getting to it and that stretch. You may need to diurese and optimize this before you wean ECMO, even after you've noted some pulsatility. Then you wean flow, and you don't really want to go below one liter for very long, and you don't want to stay at one liter for very long, as these lower rates make your patient prone to clotting the circuit. There are other approaches that are a little more nuanced or give you good guidance. Of course, on ECHO, you want to watch the RV function as you wean the ECMO. You watch the size and septal patterns, and of course, the LV. As you wean ECMO, as you see that great pulsatility, you should see a pulse pressure that's over 50. There's good literature supporting the idea that pulse pressures over 50 or even 60 are associated with successful weaning off VA ECMO. And finally, if you don't have an echo there and don't want to remember numbers for pulse pressure or want supportive adjunctive data, you can track labs as you're coming off ECMO and make sure that the DO2 is adequate by SVO2 and lactate assessments routinely. There's a great article I've cited here that talks about the different approaches that exist in the literature, but that's the basic idea is as you see good pulsatility, watch the heart on echo Check the pulse pressure as you turn down ECMO support and make sure that your heart can deal with that increased volume delivery. Support that with adjunctive labs and you might be in a safe place. That's an introduction to VA ECMO and I hope it was helpful for you to understand the basic cannulation strategies and the complications from a pretty simple drawing uh, that you can do at the bedside. I hope you have a great day and that your next patient that goes on ECMO does well and leaves the hospital vigorously. Have a good day.